Hello and welcome to this virtual launch of the Migration Museum's brand new exhibition, Departures, exploring 400 years of emigration from Britain. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Migration Museum, the Migration Museum explores how the movement of people has, has shaped us as uh, individuals, communities, and of course, as a nation. Uh, the museum is currently located in the heart of Lewisham Shopping, Shopping Centre in southeast London. Now, I can't actually remember how uh, I hooked up with the team at uh, Migration Museum, but I do remember this. It, it, when I found them, it kind of felt like it was something I'd been waiting for all of my adult life. It was somewhere to say out loud and proud, um, I am an immigrant. Uh, somewhere to say, yes, Britain gave my family uh, huge opportunities, but you know what? We didn't come here empty-handed. We came here with our talent and our capacity to contribute. And, and finally, this was somewhere to simply celebrate the nation that we have become in all its diversity, its energy and flamboyance. So what a wonderful thing it is to have a migration museum. Uh, now, as I was saying, the Migration Museum has been based in Lewisham since February, but like so many other institutions, um, it, it had to shut down in March, uh, close its doors uh, because of the pandemic, but it's now reopened from uh, Friday to Sunday. Now, the exhibition we're going to be hearing about this evening explores arguably one of the more overlooked aspects uh, of the whole question of migration. British emigration, that's people leaving the country, has been one of the largest movements of people in modern history. Tens of millions of people have left the British Isles over the last 400 years. And today, by the way, this is one of those facts, I just, you know, it, when, I, when I saw it, I thought, like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Today, some 75 million people across the world self-identify as having British ancestry. Uh, that's greater than the population of our country, which I think is around sort of 66 million or something. And yet, while immigration, people coming in, dominates debates, and I've got to say, not always um, in a good way, Britain's em emigration story is often overlooked. Now, why is this? Who are the many millions who've left the UK and why did they leave? Departures, this brand new exhibition, seeks to explore some of these stories. And this evening, we will hear from some of the Migration Museum team, um, as a, well as a small selection of contributors to the exhibition from across the world. Now, I gather there will be a chance for some questions and answers uh, at the end of the event. So please do post your questions on the live stream or tweet us, um, and that's at Migration UK, <clears throat> excuse me, using the hashtag DepartiresMM. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram, and that's at Migration Museum UK. Now, first, uh, as we set, set off the proceedings, I'm joined by Aditi Anand, who's Head of Creative Content at the Migration Museum, who's joining us from the museum, which is great to see you, uh, Aditi. Now, what I, um, as I said, uh, you know, this is one of the more, more uh, overlooked aspects of the whole migration story, it's something that's, that's shaped our world, not just our country. And I just wondered how you, how you came about wanting to do the exhibition, to put one on. Hi, George. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, right, that it's one of the biggest movements of people in, in modern history. And for most of its um, history, this country has been a net exporter of people. And it's been such an obvious story. And yet it's something that we don't talk about at all. Um, if you look at immigration debates, uh, sorry, migration debates or any kind of discussion of migration, it's always the focus of immigration. Um, and yet so it felt like this exhibition was an opportunity to tell a more fuller story about migration in Britain, and to also um, reflect on the fact that every immigrant is an emigrant, <laughs> and um, you know the motivations that people have for leaving um, Britain have, through the ages, been very similar to the motivations that people have had for coming to Britain, and that's really a thread that connects um, all sorts of different migration stories. And this year, it's the 400th year anniversary of the sailing of the Mayflower to America. Um, so we felt it was a particularly apt time to have an exhibition that looked at the last four centuries of emigration. Now, imagine, I imagine there's, there's a huge number of kind of stories you could have told. I mean, from, as you say, the Mayflower pil uh, pilgrims to, well, the Windrush deportees, 
um, and then so lots and lots of stories. How did you go about the difficult business of kind of choosing the ones that we're all going to be able to see uh, in this departures exhibition? Like, like you said, it's such a huge topic um, and, you know, such an ambitious scope that we have that we really um, decided from the start that we weren't going to try and tell an exhaustive or chronological story about immigration, but that we would um, provide a sort of snapshot of stories and look at different themes. So the exhibition is sort of divided into um, various departure gates, as we call them, and each of them explores a reason why people have um, left Britain through the ages. And within those, you'll see stories that reflect more historic migrations, such as the kind of Mayflower pilgrims, but also very contemporary recent migration. And we have, you know, stories of people who've left, I think, just before the COVID pandemic hit. Um, so they're very, very fresh stories, and they're kind of presented side by side, so we can see some of the parallels um, through history. But I would say the exhibition really came together um, because of all the people who contributed to it. I think there's something like 40 different artists, um, researchers, storytellers, advisors who've kind of worked on this exhibition. It really is a collective effort. Um, and I think it's through those different voices that the exhibition really comes to life. Um, and yes, yeah, so I wanted to really take this opportunity to thank those contributors. Um, you know, normally we would have a lovely buzzy launch with 400 people here. And um, unfortunately, you know, they don't get to be here in person to share in that. But um, I hope that they're watching from home and um, appreciate and, and know how much we appreciate their contributions. All right, Aditi. Well, listen, don't go away because, as I said earlier, that there's going to be some questions and answers uh, opportunities at the end, uh, along with your colleague, Emily Miller, who I'll introduce uh, later on. But thank you very much and then for the moment. We're now um, going to hear uh, from filmmaker Osbert Parker, who met up with Matt Plowright. Now, Matt is the head of communications at the Migration Museum, and they got together last week in the exhibition's departure lounge where visitors will be able to view his 10 minute film, which is called Timeline, before they embark on their journey through the exhibition. My name is Osbert Parker. I'm an animation director and filmmaker. So Osbert, what was your initial reaction to the brief? Well, it was, it was a combination of two emotions. I was really excited to be asked, it was a real honor to be asked as a, as a filmmaker to, to contribute to the departures and be in part of the Migration Museum community. But I was really shocked by the scale of having to communicate these personal and these quite moving narratives 400 years in originally two minutes was the time, was the duration for the film. And I thought, how can I compress 400 years into two minutes? And that was a real challenge. So after I thought, well, we don't need to tell every single person's story. What you can do is try and capture just the, the dramatic and the emotional scales of love, war, the desire to achieve something better, how, how you move because uh, your personal goals that can push and pull you from England to other parts of the world these personal, we all have these personal stories of wanting to do something better. And then to think about that, what that would have felt like 400 years ago, today and tomorrow, I thought, well, you could use metaphors in animation and to try and capture this as a universal story, but yet personal. And I also felt as though the Migration Museum is so well curated that have artists really drilling down into personal stories, I could find a way of just setting the scene as a timeline. I felt as though this human footprint, um, whether it's a digital footprint, whether it's our footprint on the environment, but the footprints our parents and our grandparents and our ancestors has left, is really interesting, this sense of a ghost in the room. I think uh, that the way, not just the way man evolves, the way transport evolves. So this idea of a footprint in nature, what that would look like, the struggles of traveling through mud, hard terrain, snow, ice, the conditions that man would go through 400 years ago to travel from here to the new world. I would try and capture the way the footprint may evolve, really, uh, whether they were singular people or packs of families. And having nature to be a big part of that was really important in the timeline. And I hope 
this timeline isn't just a piece of cold fact. I hope they're able to uh, see these dates as moments in time without having to depict every single person's kind of story. And I really hope that they feel the fragility of human travel. They see the hope and the love by the objects that have chosen to bring to life as a metaphor for the date. And I hope that they, I hope that the work complements to me the more important work that surrounds the timeline that artists have here. Departures, you know, is an exhibition about emigration, about 400 years of emigration stories from Britain. Um, you know, so often when we think and talk about migration, uh, migration is kind of used as a synonym for immigration. So many of the debates and conversations we have are around immigration, and emigration to some extent gets, is a kind of lesser explored. It gets left out often of these conversations, or if it's talked about, it's talked about in very different terms, using very different language. Um, just interested in your thoughts on sort of why this is. It inspired me that the Migration Museum wanted to shine a little spotlight on the other side of that coin, uh, that it is two sides of the same coin, and this exhibition is gonna focus on emigration, because the, the, the zeitgeist at the moment has all been about immigrants coming in, and, uh, and I think rebalancing that argument is really important and I hope the exhibition can get that word out there. There's a huge amount of talent and uh, people that have left the UK that have positively contributed to other cultures and countries. That adventure is both equally exciting and can be quite terrifying as well and I think showing that in an artistic way is a really really great way to start that question and provoke that thought in other people's minds as they come into the departures lounge. But well, finally, just on a personal level, you know, how do you connect with the themes that this exhibition, Departures, explores? I think that the themes are a human life, aren't they? Um, this kind of personal goals of wanting to move on, wanting to do something better, whether that's here or whether you travel abroad to another country for a job. Uh, whether it's love, relationships, um, or whether it's some personal uh, reason that's motivated you to leave your country and move on. I think also it's a state of mind as well, uh, personally kind of moving on. Uh, and so I, I connected with the themes of love and, and, and also, I think, violence that can also surround people being persecuted, having to move on. Uh, and I felt as though the themes in the exhibition that were being treated by artists in, in really interesting ways. They were photographic, uh, they were artistic, using objects, and I wanted to do something that would complement it. So with the violence, I would use broken glass to symbolize some kind of trauma. Um, so for me, it's a very personal kind of, uh, connection. My parents immigrated from Guyana to the UK, um, but, uh, but I feel as though I'm continuing that migration theme. Where am I gonna go next? There you go. go. That was um, Oswald Parker there talking to the Migration Museum's Matt Plowright. And I love the way he put it, uh, that, that, that emigration was, and migration and immigration rather, are, are two sort, sides of um, the same coin. Well, so thank you very much, uh, Oswald Parker, for that uh, contribution. Now, from the uh, departure land, we're now going to head further afield to hear from some of the contributors uh, who are based abroad. There are, actually, believe it or not, over 18 artists and filmmakers and 22 contributors to this exhibition. And it's, well, it's such a shame that we can only hear from a small handful of them uh, this evening. But we are uh, lucky to have messages all the way from uh, America, Australia, and of course, a little closer to home here in London uh, this evening. First off, we're going to hear from Sarah Sense now. Sarah is an artist of Native uh, American and European uh, heritage. Uh, currently, she's based in Northern California, and she's going to speak a little bit about her piece, which reflects on colonial histories and Sarah's own personal migration story. <clears throat> we'll then head off to the other end of the world, to the Southern Hemisphere, to hear from Barry York, uh, who was born in London, and he migrated with his mother to Australia 
1954. And he's going to be sharing his experiences with us uh, from his home, I think, in, in Canberra. And finally, we're going to hear from uh, the artist Rochelle Romeo, whose father was one of the first to be thrown into the media uh, spotlight after fighting to prove his British nationality for 12 years, believe uh, me, 12 years. Now, this artwork, artwork reflects on the aftermath of being affected directly by the Windrush scandal in 2018. Hi, my name is Sarah Sense. Um, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about my work that I've included in the exhibition and um, myself and um, a little bit about my research and my art. I'm originally from Northern California and I did live in the UK for over six years. I recently moved back to California with my family. Um, I'm native from my mother's side. My maternal grandmother is Choctaw and my maternal grandfather is Chittimacha. My childhood, however, was in California and I wasn't introduced to my Chittimacha community until my teenage years. And this had a really big impact on my life and influenced me to become a weaver. Through a community service program, I worked on the reservation during the summers while I was at university and through my 20s. My experience of being connected or reconnected as an outsider and also as an insider inspired me to weave baskets with my own photography and also found imagery. By 2010, I was traveling in Central and South America working on a project um, that I call Weaving the Americas. And the research took me through the Americas, the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, and then in the end, Europe. Um, while I was in Europe, I worked on a project in Ireland about the Choctaw-Irish relationship that was a connection through the potato famine. When the Migration Museum asked me to contribute a piece to departures, I immediately felt that my own personal experience of living in the UK alongside my current research at the library would be an exciting opportunity to participate in this exhibition. The piece I created for the Migration Museum is called New Orleans 29.9372 North, 90.0615 West, Galway 53.2690 North, 90.0473 West. This, of course, is the coordinates of the two ports and the numerical sequence that creates the pattern in the piece that's there in the exhibition. I'm connecting the two ports through my own personal story Yet, these ports are significant to the colonization of North America. Galway was my home for over a year and where my first son was born. And New Orleans is a cultural land to my Chittimache ancestry. I've woven landscapes of both locations into the piece. The two maps that I've included are of New England and the Northeast United States and Plymouth, England, of course, because of Mayflower. Colonially, these ports have their own stories. But for a personal twist, I wanted to include places that I also lived and felt connected to through my family and life experience. I am truly grateful to the Migration Museum for including me in this exhibition. And I am just really glad that you guys were able to do the exhibition um, after everything that's been going on this year. I wish that I was there to see it in person, but I'm glad that I could um, share a couple of things mm -hmm. with you in this video. So thank you. Greetings from Canberra, Australia. My name is Barry York. My mother Olive is one of those featured in your departures exhibition. Uh, Olive was born in 1916 in Hackney, but she grew up among the railway working class community in Iverson Road, West Hampstead. Uh, she migrated to Australia in 1954 with me as a three-year-old and with her husband, Loretto, who was from Malta. We settled in uh, Brunswick in Melbourne, which was a very much a migrant working class community. My mum had a pretty hard life. Uh, her father died when she was only 10. Uh, she lived through depression and through the blitz over London, like many, many others, of course. Uh, but the decision to migrate came from my father 
my mum didn't really want to go to Australia. My dad was determined. And uh, as life would have it, once they <laughs> arrived in Melbourne, my father hated every minute of it. And my mother fell in love with the place overnight. <laughs> uh, I, I think something that I've learnt from all this is that migrants certainly uh, make a great contribution to any society. But more importantly, the bottom line for me in a country like Australia where immigration has been very controversial at times is that migration is a good thing because it is good for the immigrants. Uh, my mother would never have dreamed when she was a young lass growing up in West Hampstead that one day she would become the mayor S of a large city. And that's what happened in Brunswick. Uh, her husband, my dad, became mayor of Brunswick and she became the mayoress in the 1970s. It was a great honour and they both uh, did a lot for that migrant working class community of Brunswick. I know that my mother would be absolutely thrilled to uh, know that she features in your exhibition and I just wish that my wife and kids and me would have been able to make the trip to London to be there in person. Hello, my name is Rachelle Romeo. I'm a 36 year old artist from North London. I'm also a mother of two and I work in FE and I am training to be a counsellor. I came involved with departures because a volunteer last year saw a piece of work of mine called Identity. Identity was created whilst I was involved with supporting my father who was affected by the Windrush candle. My father fought the government legally to get his passport that he already had but was stolen from him. Once that passport was stolen he went to the police and he attempted a few years later to renew his passport. The government said that he didn't have the correct papers. This was the home office and the passport office. And because of this, they then tried to deport him. In 2018, we've received a letter asking him to present himself or he would be at risk of deportation. From then, we were campaigning and also got some media coverage to support the fact that my father's case was illegal and he did have the right to be in the UK. Fortunately, our hard work paid off, although he had to fight for 12 years. He now has his British passport and he is now recognised once again as being a British citizen, like he was when he was born. For departures, I've contributed a piece of work called the Disowned Britain. The Disowned Britain is a follow-up to how <clears throat> I felt after my father received his passport. The trauma I still face day to day. It explores my feelings and it shares how I now feel about the country that I used to call home. I feel that my relationship with Britain since the Windrush scandal and creating those pieces of work, because those pieces of work have helped me reflect on my own feelings and channel my emotions in a healthier way. Coming from two immigrant families who came here to work after the war and build Britain up, my grandma was a nurse on my father's side and helped bring you know, the NHS together with many other people from the Caribbean and Africa and other colonial countries. So we always had a real connection with the UK. But knowing now that how quickly they are able to take away your nationality and say you're not British anymore, my relationship with the UK is broken. I feel safe in London because this is all I know. 
but realistically that safety net has been broken and I don't feel safe anymore especially now what's come to light with Black Lives Matter a movement that should not have even been there because black lives should matter like anyone else's it's really highlighted how in, in, in equal the UK is especially towards people with of people of colour and from different parts of the world that's migrated here to make Britain great. So those uh, personal and unique contributions there from, from Sarah in Northern California, Barry in Canberra, and lastly there from Rochelle. And uh, if you don't mind, Rochelle, let me just say this. Um, you, you tackled such a, a raw subject with such honesty, um, such power, and if I may say so, with such dignity. Thank you very much for that. And, you know, those three contributions do give us a window on, on the various ways in which emigration happens. Now, the Windrush scandal, which Rochelle was talking about, is a stark reminder that not all migration is voluntary. And I understand that other stories in the section of the exhibition in which Rochelle's uh, artwork is displayed, explore forced migration uh, throughout history, ranging from the fleets that carried uh, British convicts to Australia and uh, North America, to the plight of child migrants shipped across the empire, and of course, hundreds of thousands of people who've been forced to leave Britain against their will. However, it's, uh, on, a, on a different, slightly different note, our next guest this evening are going to talk about emigration on the opposite end of the spectrum. Those who leave Britain very much voluntarily from a position, if you like, of a privilege. People leave for many reasons, better weather, adventure, love, um, or to find themselves, as, as some would put it. Uh, only rarely do they think that they're leaving home for good. Some end up migrating permanently while others return for a few months uh, every year or spend part of the year elsewhere. We're now going to hear from the academic Michaela Benson and journalist Hannah Ajala, uh, both, of, uh, both of whom have contributed to the section of the exhibition exploring those who emigrate in search of the good life. My name is Hannah Ajala. I am a journalist, I'm a mentor, I'm a travel blogger, and I'm really passionate about running communities within marginalised parts of the world. I'm Dr Nicola Benson. I'm a sociologist based at Goldsmiths, and I've spent the past nearly 20 years of my life researching British emigration. I think when we think about contemporary forms of British emigration, and actually even past forms of, of emigration, there are quite stereotypical understandings of who might be leaving. And, and this is something I've encountered a lot in my own work. Working with British citizens who live in Europe, and regularly I come face to face with this idea that they're just all white pensioners who live on the southern Spanish coast, when actually I know that 80% of the people who move to Europe are working age and below. And because Britain is multi-ethnic, it's also a multi-ethnic emigration. So there are British people of colour who settled in Europe so I was really fascinated to hear about the work that you've been doing with these repats. Do you want to explain a little bit more about that work and why you think it's so important? I came across many repats during my visits going back and forth to Nigeria as an adult. And I say an adult because, um, you know, I'm very fortunate to have gone back to Nigeria with my family throughout childhood, but it was only to you know, do whatever my parents were doing at that time. So I guess as I became more interested in going to Nigeria, I could enjoy it in the way that I would with any other sort of like holiday destination. And I made friends through social media and was able to sort of experience what life was like for them. A majority of my friends there actually decided to move there from many parts of Europe, the UK, the US, literally to start their life from scratch there. And I wanted to know why, to find that it was a variety of different reasons, whether it was being tired of the monotonous lifestyle of living in the West, the hustle and bustle, um, whether it was a deeper search of, of self and feeling that they wanted to be one 
with their culture. Um, and I found that this was a growing thing that was happening um, where these repats are moving. They have some sort of plan, they have a bit of savings and they're moving for the long term. It's really fascinating hearing you talk about that because a lot of the themes that you have raised, so around kind of home, identity, belonging, that kind of, that feeling that you're not quite yourself um, and that you're looking for yourself. Those are themes that are really common um, to a lot of the work on, on lifestyle migration more generally. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, your inspiration in trying to reframe those kind of place imaginings of West Africa. Because I think that's really central to your work, not just on the repats, but more generally. What essentially inspired this trip and to physically immerse myself in the continent and spend time with these repats on you know, a day-to-day -day basis, it started with just random things that I would read about it. So the countries of the repats in this exhibition are Ghana, Sierra Leone and the Gambia. Um, countries that I continuously read about over the past year, whether it was news of current affairs or stories about violence against women or what the former you know, presidency uh, looked like. And with that research, I also wanted to sort of connect with those individuals that are on the grounds, just so I can get a bit of an understanding of what life is like there. Social media um, apps like Twitter uh, gave me a really close eye to what the experiences are like for people. So whether it's unemployment, it's a very big growing issue. Um, unemployment, um, content creation, a lot of people don't want to work for big organizations but want to build something for themselves. So there's this really big entrepreneurial um, kind of push as well. And I think, again, you know, with all this research and all the virtual relationships I was building, the only bit that was missing was me physically being there and being able to sort of experience what, uh, close to what these people go through on a day-to-day -day basis by being with them and essentially giving them the microphone to, to share their voice. As this conversation is about lifestyle migration, I guess it's not really a term many people within my social groups would, would use in conversation. Um, so with that being said, it's definitely something new. Um, and when we explore the term lifestyle migration, how would you say, Mikola, this has changed with time? I think quite a lot of the things that you've kind of drawn attention to, people seeking opportunities, whether they're for work or a range of different factors, whether it's love, whether it's for this kind of this thing that people call the good life or a better way of life. That, that was our starting point when we were thinking about lifestyle migration. So we were looking around and, and, and thinking, well, that there's a kind of a deficit here in trying to make sense of these migrations because actually they might classically re be re reduced to something like tourism. They might say, oh, these people are tourists. But as with the people that you've worked with um, in, in Gambia and Ghana and Sierra Leone, these are people who were going to establish lives. They weren't people who were going to be there for short periods of time. And yes, there were certain attractions about the places that they were moving to. They had particular imaginings of what those places might offer them, um, of what those places, what it would be like to live there. So really trying to highlight the complexity of contemporary migrations while also locating it in those um, quite deeply entrenched historical conditions that mean that some people can move and other people can't. Would you say on whichever perspective, a global, uh, you know, a, a more niche perspective, are the attitudes towards emigration shifting and changing? I think probably even, you know, the countries that you've been working in recently, actually the story about emigration is a very different one. It's one that's part of that national story about who they are and how they got there. But in the UK over the last 40 plus years, Basically, since decolonization, that history of emigration has been, has gradually left the public discussion. It's left the political discussion. Once upon a time, as, as you can see from looking around the exhibition, actually, you know, it was a talking point. You know, should I stay or should I go? With the state actively sponsoring particular forms of white emigration and also forcing some people to leave. 
And I think, I mean, just to, to kind of zoom out from the individual again as well, it's really important to recognise that emigration has been part of what made the British Empire and it's also central to how Britain is imagined today, but notably through its neglect. So that shift from empire to nation and the tendency towards what are increasingly nativist understandings of Britain and Britishness is something that we can counteract, I believe, through actually trying to deal with this past of emigration and its present. Now, we're um, almost uh, coming to the end uh, of our event this evening, but as I said um, earlier, we've got now got a chance to have um, your questions put to uh, our colleagues from the Migration Museum. So let me just introduce you th to them again. You've met Aditi Anand, who, let me remind you, is head of creative content at the Migration Museum, and we've got Emily Miller, who's head of learning and partnerships, um, and they're both going to be answering your questions now. Uh, they're, they're coming in. Emily, if I could start with, with you. This is uh, from Lorna on Twitter. Uh, this is all so important for children to learn. Are schools going to be able to visit or hear more about these topics? Thank you for the question, Lorna. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. This is um, our education programme is the heart of at the heart of what we do at the um, migration museum and so far in our different um different homes across uh, london we've seen over twelve thousand um young people um from schools primary secondary and university um obviously the um pandemic gives us some challenges um and we won't be having school visits to this exhibition um until until spring 2021 or when the government um, deems it to be safe to do so um but schools are still really showing interest in what we're doing and departures fits really squarely with one of the um, units available to, um, to schools at History GCSE um, with uh, the exam board AQA. So we're working with a local teacher um, in Lewisham who teaches that module at, um, with AQA and he is um, supporting our education program to create um, resources for students all over the UK who might never be able to visit the um, museum and those who hopefully might um, down the line um, and those are going to be those resources are going to be um, sent straight to the schools in order that um, in order that students can study it in the classroom you've already seen that we've got such a great range of stories and video content um, loads of that is going to be um, directly uh, relevant and kind of accessible for school um, pupils and Lorna if you're a teacher you can get in touch with us and we'll sort you, sort you out Emily, if I could just follow up on that, I mean, it strikes me that the way in which not just emigration, but immigration, migration in general, has become a highly kind of politicised issue. When we're talking about the classroom, when we're talking it, about it as part of our history, how do you deal with that kind of the whole politics of it? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, I think that, you know, we, we, both tread carefully as well as treading boldly, I suppose. Um, the, the, the slogan, the, the kind of raison d'etre for the whole of the Migration Museum is all our stories, because we really believe that everybody has a migration story depending on how far back or how far out you go. And for the pupils we work with, that is very much the case. Um, and the teachers who bring um, their students, their pupils um, to the museum, that's the, you know, the approach that they really welcome. So. We really start every workshop, whether it's connected to departures or connected to our previous exhibitions, Room to Breathe, Call Me By My Name. We really start with how does this fit in with your story to the pupils um, and kind of take it from there, because that takes out some of that potential tension or some of that um, negativity right from the start. And it's just really we find that pupils are um, so up for the big discussions, the big debates and sharing their stories. Um, so, yeah, that's really how we go about our education programme. Um, anyone's, anyone's welcome to come and see us in action when we're, when we're able to be in action again. <laughs> OK, um, Aditi, I've got a question here from Andrea. And uh, Andrea, sorry, I don't know why I said it that way, <laughs> uh, on Twitter. What part of the Departures exhibition do you think will uh, surprise visitors most and why? 
Well, I think it's interesting, um, and Mikula sort of uh, referred to it in her video, that when you ask people, you know, who is a British immigrant, people tend to have a certain idea in their mind of who that person is. Um, you know, is that someone who's a pensioner in southern Spain or if it's an expat? Um, so I hope with this exhibition, what will surprise our audiences is actually just how complex the story is, how many different kinds of people have left. Um, and that, you know, it's not necessarily the person you have in your mind that, um, that you're going to learn about. I mean, we have some really, really interesting stories. Um, for example, there's a story of the Dinera, which was a ship um, on which Jewish refugees in London were, um, in England rather, were um, rounded up during the Second World War, along with Nazi sympathizers, and all of them were sent um, to Australia, where they were in an internment camp. Um, and they fought to, you know, be able to come back to Britain. So again, it's one of those parts, stories that's, you know, um, part of the national migration story, which maybe isn't as um, well known. So I hope people will find lots of those little unknown stories in the exhibition. And this is a question from me, actually, which I've been itching to ask you all evening, um, Aditi. We talk about emigration, um, colonialism, I suppose, there's lots of Brits going, and, and you know, colonialism was done from a position of power, which is so often the opposite of what lots of migration stories are about. Um, could you just talk to me about that? I mean, does colonialism count as emigration? Well, we've cho yeah, well, definitely it does, because I think that's such a big part of Britain's emigration story. You know, the British Empire provided um, really unimaginable until then opportunities for people to escape poverty, to create new lives. Um, and at various points, there were immigration schemes and um, government legislation, in fact, to encourage people to go and move to the colonies. Um, so it's, some, it's a theme that comes up very um, regularly and strongly throughout the exhibition, and we've kind of addressed in almost each of the sections. Um, but I think the key to it was trying to tell um, the very personal stories, the personal motivations and ambitions that people had, while also recognizing the kind of systems at play um, that, you know, enable that movement. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it, you know, we really wanted to um, complicate that story as well. So when you, even when you look at the story of the Mayflower, you know, it's a story of people who are both refugees and colonists. Um, and so there's always, you know, there's always something more nuanced and complex at the heart of the stories. Um, and I think hopefully that will um, allow people to kind of dig deeper into, um, into this topic without it just being the kind of debates we have on Twitter about empire. Okay, well, let's get back to uh, people, our, our audience asking questions. While researching and setting up the exhibition, what did you find out about why such a rich emigration story has been so little told? And what can we do to take uh, these stories beyond the museum doors. Emily, do you want to have a go at that? Uh, sure. Um, I think we've, yeah, we've just discovered so much, um, so much richness and, and really sharing um, as much of it as we can in what is our big um, shop unit here. Um, as has already been mentioned, amazing um, numbers of contributors, um, filmmakers, artists, um, and all the research that's got in, gone into it. Um, I, I think the reason I think this is um, overlooked, as we, as Osbert's mentioned, and others, you know, we, we focus so much on on immigration. That is what is um, in the headlines all the time. Um, and yet, just a quick insight from our education program, if you don't mind, um, we do an activity. Like I said, in our education program, we um, always um, focus on pupils' own. Um, connections to migration, their own migration stories. And we do an activity where we get everyone in a big circle and we say, take a step forward if you have a parent who was born abroad, take a step forward if you support a football team that has majority immigrant players, et cetera. And gradually, you know, all the, everyone takes some steps um, in. And the last question we always ask, the last statement we say is, take a step forward if you plan, as in to the, to the pupils, to the students, if you plan to, move abroad if you plan to be a migrant to emigrate in the future um, to study to love to live to work abroad nearly every student nearly every pupil takes a step forward and we always use that as a, as a kind of final um, a final part of the activity to really explore so that's all about emigration and, and your future and that kind of unquestioned right to, to move and, and, and work and live abroad in the future so I think that that is why this exhibition is going to um, 
the richness of this exhibition it's going to get people really thinking about their own lives their own families um, and their own desires perhaps um, for for their lives so yeah. good thank you um, got another question here I think Aditi this is over to you quite a complex question actually and very very interesting it comes from uh, Jonathan via the uh, live stream and he, this is his question why do you think that people of color migrating to the UK to Australia or, or indeed to America have to struggle so much and he gives the example that we've discussed already uh, Windrush is it institutional racism and this is I think the really interesting bit do white migrants from lower classes have similar problems when they when they emigrate yeah, I think that's a, <laughs> a broad uh, question and definitely some things that um, hard to answer in a short, um, short space. So I will say we actually really have, um, we have an event coming up, uh, a digital event in collaboration with the Immigration Museum in Victoria and the Migration Museum in Adelaide, um, which ties in with their exhibition about British immigrants um, and which considers things like the white Australia policy and the treatment of white immigrants, but it also addresses the sort of challenges, um, I think, which Barry alluded to earlier, um, you know, talked about in terms of being white working class in Australia. So I hope that people will kind of maybe tune into that online event that we're having soon, um, which I'm sure we'll be able to get into this topic in a bit, a bit more in detail. All right, thanks. Listen, uh, this is just a sort of, um, it, it's a slightly mundane question, but I think it's an important one. Um, for those people who can't visit the exhibition in person uh, right now, how can people engage with the exhibition? Because actually, interestingly, I, earlier on, I went to the Migration Museum website to see if I could do it from there, uh, and I wasn't sure whether I could or not. So uh, maybe, Emily, if you could just um, answer that. Sure, yeah, of course, there are lots of people who, um, who for many different reasons, can't, can't make it um, either out of their houses or across London or to London at the moment. Um, and we're really um, keen to engage with them. Um, we're developing um, plans and ideas of how we can share um, content from the exhibition um, digitally, but something that really is um, gonna be a highlight of the of um, departures as an exhibition is, is, is our upcoming podcast. And um, we're working with an amazing um, journalist called Mukti Jane Campion, and she's been she's been off um, interviewing people all over the world about their emigration stories. And they're gonna be beautifully, beautifully produced into um, a, I think it's a 10 part podcast that we'll, we'll be releasing from the end of November. So do keep an eye on our social media channels and, um, and our website for that, George, and we won't disappoint you. You'll find, you'll find that good, I believe, that podcast. <laughs> um, Aditi, um, we, we've got a, a couple of minutes more, I, I, I think. I mean, the question I wanted to ask is, is, is this. Um, is talking about emigration uh, a way of saying, listen, you guys did it for, you know, some time ago, so it's our turn, you know, you went out. I mean, my, my, my father, um, who's, who's sadly not with us, used to, I was born in Sri Lanka and he was Sri Lankan, and he used to, every time he came back from the corner shop with his, you know, whatever, newspaper or whatever, he said, this is us doing the colonization. This is how we're doing it kind of thing. And it was a kind of reverse thing. So is there a kind of that in trying to explain migration, it's worth saying, well, actually, this is what white Brits did, you know, have been doing for centuries. Yeah, I think there's that really famous quote, which says, um, we are here because you were there. And that's certainly, you know, true um, that so many people who come to Britain, um, it's because they have links to the former British Empire or there's um, it's, it's had some relationship to British immigration. Um, but I think like more broadly, it's, um, you know, it's a question of showing that migration is just this normal human thing and people on um, people have sort of the same motivations, whether they're kind of leaving or coming. And it's in a way, it's not a question of them and us, but it's something that connects us all, this desire to move, this desire to better ourselves, to find new opportunities. Um, and I hope that that's, you know, something that people can connect to. And, and do you think Aditi, that the motivations are the same? I think, I can't remember who it was earlier in one of the films said, you know, this desire to, to, to make life better. That's the same, whether you're going, whether it's Brits going to Australia, um, either forced, you know, in boats to Australia or, or people coming in. It's, it's that same desire for a better life, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I think that's really the core of it. It's those sort of human, um, human ambitions, human desires that, that 
drive us all really. Um, so listen, uh, we've got some really important people uh, watching this uh, show. Here's a comment from local Lewisham councillor, Kevin uh, Bonavia. Um, and he says, congratulations on the new exhibition. Really pleased that the museum's back. Looking forward to seeing departures um, this weekend. Um, I think we've just about actually got to the point where, where we've um, running out of time. Um, so let me just um, thank you both, Aditi and Emily, for answering those questions, being on, on, on standby. Um, and also many thanks, obviously, to everyone who's joined us uh, this evening, including, you know, a special thank you to all the artists, the contributors, the advisors, researchers, and uh, from my point of view, most important of all that is the technicians who keep the show on the road. My God, I, I, my heart was pounding. <laughs> As, as we as we started this thing, hoping we could keep the show on the road for the full half an hour or whatever it is. Anyway, the installers, the volunteers, and all the funders who uh, made the Migration Museum's Departures exhibition uh, possible. So let me just remind you, and you heard a little bit from Emily earlier, but uh, Departures opens to the public at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Um, do visit if you can. The museum is open Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And as well as departures, you can enjoy the stunning portrait photography project Human Eye, I hope I pronounced that uh, properly, by the artist Angelica Das. There's Wall by Stick and Thierry Noir, a striking artwork, oops, sorry, a striking artwork drawn directly onto two pieces of the Berlin Wall, as well as a brand new piece by the Sing Twins, um, which features in the Migrations Museum's new online exhibition, Heart of the Nation, Migration and the Making of the NHS. And my God, aren't we, aren't we all grateful, not just for the NHS, but all those migrants who make it what it is and do so much of the hard work in keeping us safe and, and getting us uh, better when we fall ill. So visit the Migration Museum's uh, website and you can find it at www.migrationmuseum.org uh, for more information on visiting these exhibitions and the measures all um, the staff at um, the, the museum are taking to keep visitors, the volunteers and themselves uh, safe in, uh, well, in these un uncertain times. And of course, if you can't visit physically, do explore the online exhibition, the one I just mentioned, Heart of the Nation, which is accessible via the museum's website um, or at www.heartofthenation.co.uk. Now, I've got a little surprise for you, which I didn't mention at the right of the beginning. And last, by, as, uh, by no means least, uh, I understand we're now going to be joined by a very, very special guest. I'm delighted about this. He's a distinguished friend of the Migration Museum, and it's Lord Alf Dubbs. So, um, Lord Dubbs, I'm going to hand over to you to raise a glass to the exhibition's opening. It's so lovely to see you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for what you've said. And can I say... I've been a friend of the Migration Museum for a long time. I was thinking of the first exhibition, I think you were in Shoreditch, and I'd just been recently at the Jungle in Calais, and you had a display of artwork and artifacts from people who'd been in the jungle, and it brought back, it brought back again my recent visit, visit, visit to the Calais. And then, then I went to Vauxhall, where you had a larger exhibition. I do have a memory of, of being dragged onto the dance floor, was that the right exhibition or was that just a sort of a hazy memory? Anyway, uh, and now you're here. Unfortunately, I haven't been to see you yet, but I want to come, I want to come and see you in Lewisham and I hope you'll have a, a longer term stay in, in, in what, will, what will be a happy, a happy home. You know, I, I love the idea of, of, a, of an exhibition about departures because all the time we're talking about arrivals and we're talking about the tensions or alleged tensions and so on. But to talk about departures is quite something. I was thinking, as I was listening to some of the discussion, um, I'm older than probably any of you, um, at school, the only bit of departure we got was, was, was a geography master who was explaining how Australia was founded on the basis of British convicts uh, who were who sent there. And this was under the Labour government, this whole story. I mean, I don't know how long ago it was. And, and, um, and the geography master said, oh, he said, of course, um, uh, if, if, if people were sent to, sent to Australia for criticizing the government. If that was still the case, then we'd all be in Australia. And I put my hand up and said, not me, I like this. And, and there was a deathly silence. 
and my geography marks went down and down and down every term because he just didn't, didn't. Anyway, that was just. It's just to say, really, that there's so little said about what happened when people from this country went elsewhere. And more recently, we talk a lot about people who are coming here, and it's sometimes a story of courage, sometimes as we saw in the Channel, a desperate tragedy, and sometimes a story of hope. But can I just tell you a story which I think transcends both immigrants and emigrants? I was at a about two and a half years ago, I was at, in Jordan and I was visiting the largest refugee camp, which had 70 to 80,000 people. Unlike Moria, where there was this fire, which was a terrible place, the, the camp in Jordan was actually quite well built. It was prefabs and there was water and sanitation and so on. And I saw a young man and he just finished school in the camp, a Syrian. And he said, um, and I said, well, what's next? Well, he said, I've tried to get a job in the camp, I can't. I've tried to get a job outside the camp, I can't. And here was a 17 year old without hope. And it made me think that one of the things that does drive migration in all directions is a sense of hope. In that if we can give people, uh, I'll talk about in, uh, refugees for a minute. If we can give people living in terrible conditions in a refugee camp, some hope for their future, they can hang on in terrible conditions. Where there is no hope, there is absolute despair. And I think a lot of the people who left this country have gone because it's been fairly easy. Uh, you know, they, they, they've gone to nice places and they've been quite well off. Whereas a lot of people who come here have come here because this country represented hope in what was otherwise a very bleak existence. So I don't think it's quite, immigration and immigration are quite the same. But at any rate, so my theme has always been that we have to give people hope because that is important. I just finish on this, to say this, to say this, that I think the education point is absolutely crucial. I've gone and talked to quite a lot of schools and schools are utterly responsive to this sort of stories about what happened, something that they can relate to their own identity, something that reflects a wider understanding of this country and what's happened. And I, I just commend you, what you can do in terms of education is absolutely superb. I know you're doing it, you can't do enough because I think, I think therein lies the hope for people in the future who will understand both immigration and refugees and will also understand emigration and understand that there is a world of movement. And finally, can I say this? So I think movement is, is going to go on. Uh, I think we're in a world where you can't stop it. I know we have a Home Secretary who thinks she can stop it, if I can be political enough to say that, but you can't, you can't stop it. Uh, there are people who are on the move to better their lives, because they feel they're going to have a better or happier future. They, they flee for safety, they flee for security, uh, they, they flee for love, They've, and they're going to be more people on the move because of climate change. So all these things are going to happen. So as a world, we've got to get used to movement in, movement out, and it'll be the norm. And I hope that new education will education programs will deliver that. And can I say thank you very much indeed. I think the, the Migration Museum is such an exciting project. It's even more exciting when I've heard what you've said. And, and uh, I, I just look forward where I can to, to having a look. Uh, don't move on to somewhere else to stay in Lewisham. I like Lewisham. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know there was a call coming in from uh, Kevin Bonavere, a, a local councillor, who's a friend of mine in Lewisham. Uh, and he, uh, um, he's done great, great in in getting Lewisham Council to be more supportive of refugees. You get, there are some great people around and you are great people, all of you. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me.